Get started. Thank you for joining us and welcome for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm your host, Richard Restucia, and today we're going to be talking about what's the latest ag tech for irrigation. Uh, as you all know, there's a big tug of war between ag water and urban water use, and currently we're experiencing a mega drought in the West, right? Maybe a 21 year drought, uh, according to my math. And typically in the past, when we've had challenges in the US, the one thing we always go to for solutions is technology. And technology has been a solid bet in the past for solving problems uh, in the US. And my question today is, is it going to be a solid solution for our water woes going forward? And so then as I think about ag tech and what's been happening, I think about, well, ag tech's a lot of things. So how does ag tech really relate to irrigation? And when I started to think about all this, uh, boy, Jeff Toole came to mind right away. He's the executive VP for Jane Distribution Holdings. He's the thought leader for ag technology at Jane. And more importantly, he just released about a year ago, uh, Jane Water Management uh, Consulting Services for Agriculture that got off to a tremendous start. They were the winner of the new product contest uh, with the Irrigation Association uh, for the Water Management Services Specialty Agriculture uh, category. And man, they have been super successful for quite a while now. So when I think about all that, I think about my questions about ag technology, Jeff was the perfect guest for this. And so Jeff, thank you for joining us today and welcome. Thank you for having me. I'll tell you what, what an introduction. I'm, I'm, this is like the uh, WWE or something. I was ready for you to roll <laughs> off the let's get ready to rumble. So, uh, good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, yeah, I don't know if I wanted to go that far or not, but uh, <laughs> listen, uh, you, you guys have had this great success in not just product sales, but now consulting services sales. Um, but one thing I think that a lot of people uh, wonder about, uh, and that is, you know, this word ag tech. It's a big word, right? It means a lot of things. I don't know. I was at uh, Western Growers a few years ago and you know, there's a cart that followed you around in the field that you, you worked with, and that was ag tech. So, you know, help right. us out here. You know, Jeff, what to you, what what is ag tech here? You know, I'm gonna, I, I mean, a picture is worth a thousand words, and, and I wanted to kind of open this up with um, this statement. So, I was looking around, and you know, I get various uh, updates, you know, via the internet and uh, things that I monitor. So, this popped up the other day, and I thought, what a great example to show to our, our guests today of what ag tech is. I mean, here we have a robotic bee. So this project was granted uh, 640,000 pounds, British, British pounds, which is about $840,000. And the two scientists, one US, um, one in the UK, um, leading in their fields are, are literally being funded to develop robotic bees. And what that picture that you're seeing there is, you know, where they're going, it, it's an actual um, robotic bee. To give you an idea of the size, it's, it's about the size of a fingernail and it weighs a quarter, one quarter of a normal bumblebee. Uh, and bumblebee for them, they called it a honeybee. Uh, so honeybees, when you think about that size, what's really driving this is there's the buzz that actually helps pollinate agriculture. So we, we need bees and there's a couple different ways that pollination occurs. And one of the ways is through these vibrations. So they're studying the vibration of the bees buzz, which shakes the pollen and the force. So they're looking at the frequency and the force and they are going to create robotic bees that do this. Now, their intention was not to replace bees, but in order for us to extend agriculture into areas where bees can't live uh, for climate reasons or populations have been um, dramatically reduced uh, because of climate issues and or uh, disease and, and other other you know problems, this is going to help um, 
those in agriculture was kind of humorous that in this article they talked about growers in areas um, that don't have bees using electric toothbrushes to try to uh, emulate the frequency of the bee buzzing to shake the pollen. And they've got some other different types of technology that they use for shaking. But, you know, can imagine going around and, and having to shake the plants in order to, uh, to create the pollination. So it's, it's just a, it was an interesting, um, an interesting example of ag tech. It, it's, it's not just irrigation. It, it really covers the breadth of, of all the things related to, to ag. It's pretty fascinating too, um, Jeff, because when you first told me about this, my imagination, you know, got wild. Yeah. And I was thinking about these bees actually flying through the air, right? But that's not the case. And uh, when I was looking at a, uh, a robotic weed puller, you know, to put in your field, I was thinking about something that actually, you know, stood up and walked, not something that was on four wheels that went between the plants, paused and, and used a device to uh, break up the weeds. So it, right. it becomes a lot more imaginable when you don't let your, uh, your, your mind go crazy with it. Absolutely. And uh, so with that, I'll go into a little more depth. That was just kind of a cool example. And I, you know, looked at a bunch of different sources and studies and so forth. And what I was, what I came up with was, in, in, in simple terms, ag tech is the use of technology in the form of hardware and or software to improve agriculture production, efficiency, profitability, and sustainability. You can see, you know, I just I circled uh, this statement with all of the things that, you know, go into and or are affected by, and, and this is just a, a sampling, you know, that we could go on and on here, but things like artificial intelligence, we've all heard that, uh, machine learning, irrigation automation, obviously near and dear uh, to our heart, uh, sensing also something we'd see in the field, imagery, you know, looking at satellite imagery, intelligent irrigation scheduling, again, these are, these are in the irrigation uh, area, but things like pest management, plant genetics, um, you know, one of the statements looked at, you know, called at the intersection of technology and agriculture, um, integrated farming systems, which really refers to, you know, everything on the farm, you know, every operation on the farm being linked and integrated in some way where they're uh, data, monitoring, controls um, are all passed seamlessly, you know, from point to point. Smart machinery, you talked about, you know, the robotic weeder. That's a, that's a smart machinery. We just saw a video recently of a, um, a robotic, um, it was an apple uh, harvester. And if you can imagine this, I should have probably got this little video on this thing. It's a cart that's going through between the rows and it has drones tethered to it and they have the ability to you know take the apples off the tree they, they have using artificial intelligence and machine learning to recognize you know the specific fruits and when that fruit would be you know ready to 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 pick and it then flies down and puts it in the in the cart so you know there's just huge uh, advances being made. You know, one of the things I wanted to say to kind of put things into perspective, the World Bank says that agriculture represents nearly eight trillion uh, as an industry globally, eight trillion. Um, and so the study that they, they published went on to say that there is there's just a profound potential um, for new technology and innovation. And um, it's uh, the, the things that we're faced with and where we're going with ag tech is, is quite impressive. And it, you got something? You got a question? Yeah, so this. <laughs> Sorry, I, just, I get going, I get wound up here. Yeah, no, I, I, I like this, right? Yeah. And uh, 
is um, you, you watch technology come about. Uh, I, I think one thing's for sure, you know, from my perspective, it's really fun to use, right? I like technology. Yeah. And, um, and this slide, you know, makes my head spin when I see all this stuff in a good way, mm -hmm. right? I start to yeah. think about all yeah. the good things to do. But one thing that's kind of nagging at me, and I think a lot of other people too, is, is all this really necessary? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I can tell you there's a lot of people spending a lot of money, you know, to try to figure that out. Um, you know, I had looked at some data on the amount of dollars that have been invested in ag funder reported in their agri food tech, agri food tech report 2021 that 51 billion was invested in 2021, uh, which that represented about almost 3,200 deals. Wow. And, um, you know, that's broken up for our industry. It's kind of broken up into what they call downstream, which is consumer facing. So that includes things like e-grocery and um, all of the elements on the food tech side that face consumers. That was about 32.1 billion of the 51. And then you have the upstream um, which is really farm print facing. And that, that's kind of where we live. And there was about almost 19 billion um, invested in, in that area. And for the first time ever, the, the downstream was higher than the upstream. And so, you know, when you think about this, that's, that's 3,200 deals that were done. So think about how many startups this is funding and what's scary is how few of them will really make it past two to three years. And, and so I know one of the questions in our mind is how do growers decide with so many new companies and new technologies being thrown at them? Yeah, so um, definitely, Jeff, that, that, that is an important question, but I still, I'm still trying to whittle down on, is this all really necessary? I mean, what's the, yeah, what's sure. the projection, you know, going forward for, uh, I, I mean, we've got, we've, for, for food, right? We've gotten yeah. away with not, uh, not doing much of this uh, over the past uh, 100 years, thousands. Absolutely, hours. absolutely. So that was kind of the next big question. And, you know, so we look at, why is this important? You know, why is ag tech? Why is this subject? Why are we even talking about this today? And it's really about spurring innovation. You know, we've all seen the reports and I think read the stats about um, the projected 70% rise in global food demand by 2050. You know, that that's it really started a lot of the ag tech um, investments and um, things that were going into that. And these projections are, are real, you know, just to put that into perspective for people, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, they project that we will have to produce more food in the next 40 years than we have in the last 8,000 years combined. So in the next 40 years, more food than the last 8,000 years combined. And that was very sobering, you know, for me when I was, you know, reading through some of these uh, statistics. And the biggest growth area for that, which is also um, creating tremendous pressure, is middle class. That that's what's projected, and that is what is growing in underdeveloped countries and all over the world. And the bottom line is, is that middle class grows; they become, you know, uh, more affluent. And they want more meat and fish and fresh vegetables, fruits, wine. Why not? Um, it was an interesting statistic that I read uh, that I wanted to share. And they're projecting that as that middle class grows, the per capita meat consumption will grow in areas outside of the United States. <clears throat> We're in a whole different class. But it'll grow from nine kilograms, which is current, that's nine kilograms per year per person to 58.2 kilograms per year. Now, a lot of people are saying kilograms, what the heck? So in the US today, we consume on average 120 kilograms, which is 256 pounds. 
uh, of meat per year. So, you know, a lot of the other developing countries in this developing middle class, you know, they're still not going to be near what the U.S. consumption is, and uh, but they want more protein. And um, the math, the math on that is not rocket science, and it's really easy to see, you know, how how huge the challenge is, you know, ahead of us. And I tried to put some of the the elements on this slide um, to really show what we're up against. You know, we uncertain climate change. We hear it, we see it. Um, you know, we're all kind of living through that. It, it's happening. We are having a changes in climate. And you know, I think globally, there's been changes in climate since, you know, our earth was formed. Um, yeah, I think we are probably having some negative impacts there and, and need to need to make some changes. It's creating water scarcity and drought. We're all seeing rising input costs. Um, some of the energy constraints that were being put under the socioeconomic uh, impact. One that I, I thought of kind of at the last minute, the rising life expectancy, you know, where we are, medicine is advancing. Um, we're living longer. And uh, with that comes more demand for food and, and for water. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You made a couple of really good points that I, I, I want to be sure we really touch yeah. on. And, and one of your points, right, is this uh, rise of the middle class mm -hmm. and more people coming out of poverty. And, you know, Jane's been a, um, Jane's made this a really big uh, objective for them uh, to bring people out of poverty into a living wage and uh, especially Absolutely. for growers. And yep. that's been great to see. Now, when, when, when you were growing up, Jeff, were, were your parents foodies? Right. This is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My parents weren't foodies. I, I didn't even know the I term were, foodie, no. and you know, till a while ago. And now everybody is a foodie. People are caring a lot more about food. It has to do with leisure time and you know what you're focusing on, and that that certainly is becoming a big uh, a big thing. For sure. I mean, where I, I grew up in the South, and you either fried your food or you fried your food. There was no. <laughs> that was pretty uh, pretty much it. And, um, you know, when I was looking through this, the, the World Bank and FAO studies, where is all this population going? The population increases are predominantly in urban areas. And so when you think about that, we're seeing a huge shift and this, this, this scares us on the ag side and, and it's, you know, it's very concerning, but there is a huge shift that's that's forcing the energy and water resources to be pushed into these urban areas. And today, the only place that can come from is agriculture. And so we have to plan, we have to plan to grow more with less. And, um, you know, we're already seeing these these shifts right in our own backyard. Um, we're seeing it across the US and around the world. And, um, you know, I think I probably don't need to harp on it anymore. Everybody knows how real, you know, this is. And it's not the, the challenge, it's a hill. It's a hill to climb is one of the ways I would I would look at this. Yeah, so Jeff, when we think about then ag tech and irrigation, mostly what are people talking about? You know, let me let me jump to the next slide. You, you perfect question. So for us, you know, for, for here at Gene, one of the big areas of emphasis for us and our primary focus is on you know, what role does irrigation play? And then specifically in my area, you know, what role does ag tech play in, in irrigation? And, you know, for me, the simple, you know, the role is that it enables water input and labor optimization, enhancing crop yield, quality and uh, and grower profitability. And that was as simple as I could put it and as succinct as I could put it. Um, you can see some of the inputs here that I put here. I left a few of the, the ones from the um, other slide where uncertain climate change, you know, without irrigation, you can't react to changes in the climate. A water scarcity and drought, you know, we got to have the most efficient ways to irrigate, you know, using drip, micro, and being super efficient with that. Obviously, irrigation automation is a big one. I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
um, imagery there, intelligent irrigation scheduling. I'll talk a little bit about that as, as well. Um, you know, the limited arable land and availability, that's really about getting more crop per drop and, and being able to get more out of the ground uh, that we have. So uh, production efficiency. Um, one of the things that I looked at was, again, in, in the World Bank report, it, it said the amount of irrigated acres represents about 20% of the total cultivated land um, in the world. And that contributes, that 20% contributes 40% of the total food production worldwide. So, you know, easy math, on average, irrigated uh, acreage produces twice the yield of non-irrigated land. And um, when, we, when we go, when we go yeah, to more crop per drop, it means yeah, 100%, irrigation. 100%. And, and micro irrigation in this case, right? Yep, totally. You know, we, we already talked about kind of the shift of water from, you know, into urban areas, but the report went on to say that uh, the only way farmers will be able to increase yields with less water is to innovate irrigation practices using technology. There is, there really, we can't make more water. Um, so we have to use it more effectively, more, more efficiently. And it's interesting, I think a lot of growers that we talk to and, you know, when you read about our industry, growers believe uh, that there is efficient with water today and the industry has made great strides um, in the past two to three decades. But there is no, no doubt that there is more efficiency to be had using technology. And um, you know, I wanted to give a couple of, of examples that are frankly very easy uh, to implement. There are things that we've talked about in the past, but I, I wanted to be just very simple and concise with these. So the first thing I would say, the first uh, opportunity would be pump and valve automation. And you know, the reality is that with competing priorities, human error, and just if you think about it, just driving around the field workers simply cannot consistently start and stop irrigation as effectively as technology. And we, you know, we have gene logic users that have seen five, 10, 20% reductions in water use simply by precisely starting and stopping irrigation every event throughout the growing season. And it, it sounds simple and it is simple. Um, you just, it, it doesn't happen in practice the way a lot of people think it does until they automate and realize that 10 hours means 10 hours or five hours means five hours, um, which kind of drives me into the second part of this, um, the second opportunity, which, which is maintaining water in the effective root zone. If you are not monitoring how deep your irrigation is going and managing your run times to keep water in the root zone, in the root zone, then I guarantee you are over irrigating more often than you think. And I can say this because I see it even in fields that are monitored, um, but have no automation or the grower is irrigating based on the way he's always, he's always done it. We, we see it all the time. Um, I think when you, when you, with automation and being able to automatically start and stop the pump, looking at the soil moisture in the root zone, you can't run that, that 24 hours or that 48 hours. Sometimes the soil, you know, calls for two or three irrigations that are broken into 10 hour sets or eight hour sets in order to keep that water where it needs to be. And without automation, it's simply not cost effective to send, you know, a crew or an irrigator out there, you know, three, four, five times more frequently than they would if they just run irrigation for a full day or for 48 hours. Um, so it's, it's, these are two very simple things. We do it every day, but it is not, nearly as pervasive, you know, as it should, as it should be. 
Um, I also wanted to point out when you think about those two things, starting and stopping your water on time, you're not only going to save water, you're going to save inputs um, by keeping those inputs into the root zone. You know, it's obvious that if you are pushing water past the root zone, then you're going to push your fertilizer, you know, past the root zone. And then it's also going to save energy because you're only running your pump when you need to and labor um, because you're not having to send uh, people out, you know, the, the field guys out all the time. There's, there's one last, you know, third one. So I said two, but I want to throw out, I'll call it a, a bonus application. I really feel using satellite based field monitoring to see the crop water consumption is, is huge. Um, you know, we all know this as crop evapotranspiration or ETC. Our team um, on the gene side uses this as a critical input for our water management services, you know, Richard, that you, you graciously called out. Um, it really gives us reliable guardrails on determining how much water needs to be applied. So when you think about it with, with this information um, of how much water needs to provide, you look and you have the soil moisture and automation I can, I can now know how much water, how long I need to run my irrigation to keep it in the root zone, uh, and then make sure that the intelligent schedule I created runs exactly as it should. It's, it's, it's like hitting the trifecta. Why, why wouldn't everybody, why wouldn't everybody do this? Yeah, Jeff, I think you touched on three really important things here. Um, one, We've all had the experience of uh, forgetting to shut something off that we manually turned on. We all have had that. Yeah. Um, and, and we know this happens in very serious situations at work. So uh, to automate that would be great. The other thing is, is we've also not turned stuff on that we should have, right? We've, yeah. we've, everybody's had this experience, so that, that, that's easy to get. Yeah. The other one, uh, man, if somebody gave you a truck with no fuel gauge in it and said, drive this to Bakersfield and back, and you don't know where you're starting, and you don't know what you have, when, so you, you would stop more often than you would anticipate to put more gas in your tank because you wouldn't want to run out. Right. I, I think that really, you know, when you don't know, you're going to overdo it. Totally. I think, great I think great example. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, satellite imaging. When I first saw this, you know, and I was showing it to a grower, and a grower said, Hey, man, that's all I need. <laughs> He couldn't believe how easy it was. And I said, well, hang on a second. There's more to it than just this. But this has been a game changer, hasn't it? Absolutely. And I think, you know, it can be uh, a, a solution. Of course, you know, we want, uh, you know, growers to look at what's happening in the soil and, you know, from a soil moisture standpoint. Um, I, we think that's, you know, a critical element to it. And certainly you want to start and stop. But if, if you didn't have anything else, you'd at least want to know how much water your crop was consuming so that, you know, like you said, on that trip to Bakersfield, if you didn't have a fuel gauge, but you had something that told you how many gallons you were using, you'd know at least how much you needed to put back. So if you knew you used 10 gallons going down, you're going to put 10 in at least to get back, you know, get back home. So, you know, I think it plays through that analogy. Yes, yeah, so um, there's a lot of great technology right now. Satellite imaging, soil moisture sensors, the dashboards, the scheduling. Um, I'm always surprised that uh, more of this isn't being used, right? I would think 100% of the growers would be using this and I know that's not the case. What's, right. uh, what's holding people back here? You know, it's... Uh... Thought a lot about this one because this is what I deal with. You know, I think all of us in the industry that are out working to to supply you know technology to growers, you know, are, are dealing with this. And for me, all roads lead to grower trust issues, data overload, you know, overwhelming complexities, and the lack of actionable solutions. And I really thought hard about distilling that down and what is you know what is holding us back. What is what's holding growers back? from adopting this, you know, more rapidly. 
And, you know, when I looked at what feeds into this and what's, what's causing this, you know, why are there grower trust issues? You know, one of the items up there failed, you know, ag tech companies, you know, we've heard of bins or, you know, sheds with abandoned ag tech in it, techs moving too fast, um, water districts that are lagging. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just, in just a minute. You know, distorted incentives, you know, NRCS and others, you know, it's, it's the incentives that aren't, aren't out there, um, I think, and positioned in, a, in, a, in the right way to really help growers adopt technology, you know, more rapidly. A generational shift, you know, just going from, you know, generations that didn't grow up with technology to the next generation of farmers that have grown up with technology and, and aren't afraid of technology and actually use it more in their day-to-day -day life and, and they want to see it you know on the farming side and there's simple things that you know but they're very pervasive and that would be poor after sales support and service we see it here all the time insufficient training you know sometimes insufficient training can be that can be on the grower you know, they, you, the grower pays money to have a system installed. Maybe they send somebody or they do the training themselves. They're in a big hurry. They got a lot of stuff pulling them in, you know, many different directions and the training doesn't take. Uh, they don't really give it the attention. I'll figure it out later. And then we find that they're not using the technology, you know, really how it was intended or to its, its fullest extent. Um, you know, we've all heard of the big data. I think, you know, that's a bit causes trust issues and, and other aspects of our life as well. You know, who's who's listening on my on my device, you know, when I'm talking or something like that. Um, but I think one of the bigger issues that we've seen over the last several years is, you know, there's too many players chasing the next investment funding round instead of, you know, chasing sustainable solutions for growers. Um, you know, how can I develop a long term relationship or partnership with a grower when I'm trying to sell a quick fix and I'm moving on to the next grower because that's what I need to do in order to get that next round of funding. Um, you know, some of the studies and the research out there, you know, puts estimates that the ag tech industry uh, value will be at 22 billion by 2025. In order for that to happen, there has to be a huge adoption acceleration um, and these estimates. So when investors read 22 billion, you know, in this this time window, it really it really fuels them. It gets them fired up that fuels startups, um, which in turn, you know, they're chasing this extreme adoption rate by growers. Right. You see this big number. You see how many growers there are. You see how little adoption there is of technology and everybody says, oh, man, we're going to get thousands of growers to adopt this technology tomorrow, you know, this year. And, um, you know, when that doesn't happen, startups fail, investors, you know, they pull out and, and it's just the, it's it's the nature of the beast. Um, it's, it's the way investment banking happens. More money goes into success, goes into the next big thing. Um, so those that are truly successful and build sustainable businesses, you know, go on uh, and become self-sustaining. Everybody else is kind of left holding the bag. And um, that that cycle just kind of goes goes on and on. Yeah, so I would think, Jeff, uh, your customers have to have a lot of peace of mind because they know Jane has been around a long time. Jane has been pushing conservation and sustainability since the 70s. So this isn't uh, a new concept to Jane. They've been uh, invested in this for a long time. Absolutely. You know, and if I were to give advice um, to growers, I would say they should consider company longevity and the financial wherewithal uh, when evaluating ag tech. You know, don't, don't be afraid to ask a startup, how long will their current funding last? You know, we ask that question. We get to look at opportunities to acquire companies at times. And so when you ask that and somebody gives you a, a six month answer or they give you a three month answer or in, in a you know a better case, they might say, yeah, we got 18 months 
um, of funding right now. And, you know, if you're thinking about buying that technology, you better hope they find some money before the end of that 18 months in that best case scenario, or you may be left, you know, holding that technology. And if it feels like they're offering prices that are too good to be true, then they probably are. Uh, they probably are too good to be true because you have to, it's just like growers have to get enough for their crop in order to sustain their growing operations. Companies have to charge enough for the technology to pay for R and D and the support and the service and all the things that go with that. And when companies don't do that, they don't last very long, but they will do it during these investment phases because we're really pushing for uh, heavy adoption because you know what heavy adoption does. I got, I got 200 sites, you know, in the last quarter, Okay, let me give you some more money. This sounds like it's really going good. Well, what they didn't say was they gave away 200 sites or they gave it at, you know, an unfair market price that, uh, you know, and, and it's just, it is a cycle and we see it. We hate to see it. We hate to see it because growers get left holding it and it reinforces that whole trust issue that we talked about. Um, you know what, Jane, it's, you know, it is probably a little self-serving, but it's no secret, you know, that we acquired three technology companies that went through this exact cycle. And um, those, you know, most of those people are here with us today and they, they would they would tell you, you know, it was exciting, but it was a meat grinder. And, you know, for, for Jane, we felt like these were the best companies in the industry and they had more than 25 years of combined experience. There was, well over a hundred million invested in these companies. You know, Gene has been around for more than 30 years. We have the financial wherewithal, we have a, a global presence and we can sustain and are committed, you know, to ag tech. And um, it's, again, it's kind of a bit self-serving, but it's a hundred percent true when I say that Jane is the type of company um, and has the type of ag tech that growers can confidently invest in. You know, we don't have all the answers uh, today, but we're in it for the long haul. And you can trust your investment will not end up in the shed alongside uh, those that are gone or have stopped supporting their technology. And that's really important to me. It's important to the whole team, to, to everyone in Gene, to be able to sell with confidence that um, they're not gonna leave growers high and dry. Yeah, so, you know, Jeff, last year we had uh, Charles Fishman on as one of my guests, best-selling author, yeah. The Big Thirst. One thing he was saying about ag technology was, it takes a while to learn it. You have to invest yeah. some time in it. He said, if the government's not giving some type of incentive to learn it or get it, people might not get involved yet. I see the adaption of technology sped up when I get a coach or a consulting service to help me. Do Absolutely. you think this has been uh, part of the success of your uh, water management consulting services group? I totally do. I mean, it's um, it, it really allowed us to you know form a partnership as, as I've talked about before, and that partnership is real. Um, you know, when a grower can pick up the phone. He might text, he might call, you know, whatever they, they prefer, but when they can talk to uh, Connor or Damien or one of our, or, you know, Corey, one of our experts, and they know that they know their field, they've been in that field. Um, they know that the technology works, they know we know how to use that technology, and we can have very open, very honest conversations, and, and we can make adjustments um, we can move on the fly and that whole iterative process has been really beneficial you know for the growers i think it really it really knocks down the barriers and some of the fears that they have about technology when they see what we're doing and they're kind of like yeah this isn't that hard um i i can i can do this and as i've mentioned before we've got you know a number of the growers that uh, took over the technology themselves and they're now doing um, water management services for themselves. And frankly, in time, 
they will be better at it than we are because that is their field. It is their crop. They, nobody knows it better than they do. Yeah, that's a great point and, uh, and very interesting. So Jeff, I have one last question for you today. Yep. And that's uh, for ag tech irrigation, you know, what's the future hold? What are some of the cool things we can be looking for uh, in the future? Absolutely. So I didn't, I knew you were going to ask me that and I didn't make a slide for that. Um, I, I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about that and give, you know, some perspectives on what I think. And I'll, I'll start with the industry. So from an industry perspective, I think there will be continued churning of huge investment dollars. Uh, startups will come and go. It, that's inevitable. Some will survive uh, through sound business plans and innovative technologies. We hope for that. I mean, we hope for um, growth in the industry um, as, as it, we need it. You know, all the slides that I had of the why before really, you know, point to the need for that. Uh, I believe we will start to see some consolidation where larger, more successful companies will acquire specific technologies to help round out their own offerings. Um, I know that grower adoption will continue to accelerate as, uh, as the struggle for diminished resources and, and goals uh, to achieve sustainability continues. I mean, it's, it's ongoing and I, and I believe we've seen, you know, growers starting to, to step up um, and, and move to technology I think we'll see greater success in the water input and labor savings achieved through larger scale implementation of ag, ag tech. And what I mean by that is large corporate farming operations will, they'll transition from trials and testing to full scale implementation. And I believe with this will come, you know, larger scale systems integration which will help growers move, you know, from chasing data across platforms to implementing tangible solutions in their daily operations. You know, today we hear it all the time, you know, growers, it's very inefficient. So I, 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 I hate to say the word hate because it's not just that they hate it because it's a pain. It's very inefficient from a time perspective. If I have to jump from platform to platform to platform to platform, um, I got to I got to go on four log in four different times, you know, to get the information I need. And then on three of them, I got to somehow convert data into information and make a decision on it. And I think, you know, what we're going to see in the future is there's going to be some consolidation of that. There's going to be more integration across those platforms. And, you know, you're going to see, you know, more comprehensive systems. I hope this is what we see that, you know, are going to provide growers with with solutions. For Jane, I can certainly speak to, you know, we're going to continue to invest in people, uh, technology, and our growers. You know, that is, that is first and foremost. That's where our investments are going. You know, on the more practical side, you know, we'll be releasing new hardware that will allow for, for more broader, more cost efficient, you know, monitoring and and control across all aspects of the farming operation. We, we plan to continue to expand gene logic with widgets designed to distill down the underlying data and bring growers actionable solutions. It's, it's our main goal. We, we don't want to be and will not be just a data purveyor. Um, I've had growers, you know, get irate in meetings when they see data that's being you know thrown out and and i, I can't blame them when and, and these were early learning lessons where you feel proud that you're bringing all this data and the grower is saying do you think that i have time to sit around <laughs> and go through all of this data and it's so true and uh and and so that's really a, a huge driver uh, for us there's a lot of energy and resources going into enhancing our irrigation scheduling tools and on-farm automation. So there's gonna be some really cool things uh, coming out on that. We're also um, going to be expanding our use of uh, satellite information. 
and I'm super excited about that. You know, I could I could go on and on uh, because you know our investments in, in development it really ex excites me. You know, for for our future and our entire team is excited and committed you know, to our grower partnerships. They all know, you know, how bright the future of ag tech is at Jane. And it's, it doesn't make their job easy uh, or, or the grower's job easy, but really nothing worth doing is, is ever easy. And so we're gonna continue pushing, we're gonna continue working, um, developing, growing our partnerships with our growers um, and, and expanding. So I think the whole team is, is super excited about, uh, about the future, not just for Gene, but for the industry, you know, as a whole. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. And uh, my gosh, uh, it's been a great uh, session today to learn about ag tech from somebody who is out there doing it every day. Right, you're hearing from customers, you're hearing from growers, you're hearing from your team. And uh, it's an opportunity we don't uh, very often get to have. So you sharing all this information has been uh, wonderful today. I really appreciate it. Now, I think you have another slide that's got your contact information. I do, on. yep. So, um, <laughs> if people have additional questions, want to follow up, uh, this is how they get a hold of you? Absolutely, always available. The whole team is always available. I think we make it a habit of putting our contact information up there. And um, I should probably think about just putting the whole team up there. It's, it's, uh, we love hearing from, from the growers and everybody is, is very uh, competent and uh, always, always looking to develop new relationships and answer questions. So you can start with me. Yeah, well, that's great, Jeff. I'm so generous of you to spend uh, this time sharing what is really um, uh, unique and valuable information. You know, not a lot of people have the insight into the marketplace that you do. So thanks for sharing this. I want to thank all our viewers today uh, for spending a little bit of their day with us. We really appreciate it. If you've got some ideas for subjects you'd like us to have webinars about, please send them to me or send them to Jeff. You got his email right here. We'd love to uh, delve into the things you're interested in. Uh, for, uh, and as all of you know, you can go to janesusa.com, see all our past trainings, uh, got about 175 of them up there now. A uh, great place to educate yourself about water management, sustainability, and conservation. We're also wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, you can find us there. Again, Jeff, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time. Thank today. you, Richard, and happy Easter to everyone. Yeah. Happy Easter. And uh, we'll see you guys all next week. Uh, talk to you later. Have a great weekend. Yep.